Well, talking about a punch in the gut. This book, guys. This book. Hi, it's Kamil here, and I'm coming to you with the third review of the International Booker Prize longlisted book. And today, as you already know, we're going to talk about The Discomfort of Evening by Marika Lucas Rienveld. One of the most widely talked about books on the long list, if not the most prominent one, I read the last one third of it looking like this. Wide open eyes, wide open eyes. The narrator of the novel, 10 years old Yas, lives with her family on a cow farm in a reformed, very religious community, where on the everyday basis her father is quoting the Bible and quizzes the children to test their knowledge on it. The life of the family is organized around the livestock, but mostly around the cows, which are more important than anything else, to the point that the father of the family smells of cows even if he just had a bath, as Yas tells us. On one of the Christmas evenings, Yas observes her older brother Matthias' preparation for going skating at a nearby lake. Before closing the doors, he turns around, waves to her and is gone. Matthias dies the same night, drowned in the ice-cold water. As of now, Yas and her siblings Hannah and Oda go on a dark and very sexually graphic crusade to bring Matthias back to save themselves and the family. The death of Matthias affects the family profoundly in many ways. Yas stops taking her coat off, her mother stops eating, the brother Obe becomes increasingly cruel and sexual, while the two girls, Yas and her younger sister Hannah, are working on the plan to find a savior on the other side. The other side means the side outside of the religious community. From the beginning, this is a novel of graphic depiction of every aspect of the farm life, starting from physiological fluids and excrements, both human and animal, to cruelty against animal and sexual acts. I imagine the diarrhea splattering onto the grass like the caramel sauce my granny poured onto the rice pudding. You get the idea, right? As the situation in the family deteriorates, the cruelty increases, sexual acts become more graphic, and the plot acquires more and more characteristics of a dark, disturbing tale. Marika Lucas Rienveld is a poet, and their usage of the language is excellent. It's a mixture of poetry and profane, delightful and hideous, and of course it wouldn't feel that good if it wasn't for the translation of Michelle Hutchinson. I don't know Dutch, while here the English translation makes the narration flow. However, this is a novel that rather tells you the story than shows it to you. Of course, the telling the story part comes with the form of a narration, where Yas, being 10 years old when the novel starts and 12, 13 years old when the novel ends, is our only window to this family dark trauma. We are constantly in her thoughts, and she is the most observant and neurotic 10 years old I ever seen. She constantly observes, analyzes, questions. There are a few scenes here in this novel that Yas and you as a reader don't have the access to. For instance, when the cow shed doors are closed for Yas's eyes. Hiding behind them, her brother Oba and the dad. But it's quite clear what's going on behind those doors, or at least this is what everything seems to suggest. Rinve decided to give the narration of the discomfort of evening to the child, and that decision carries a lot of consequences. There are uncountable examples of books narrated by children, right? There are various very successful examples too. Modern classics like Huckleberry Finn or To Kill the Mockingbird, or slightly newer, The Bastard Out of Carolina, to name a few. The advantage of writing with a child voice is the natural appeal and compassion that it evokes within us, the readers, and to some extent it makes a novel relatable, as we all were kids once. However, 
I still believe that this is a bold move to give the narration into the hands of a child, as the problems that an author can stumble upon going that direction are many. The main one is how to make the 10, 12 years old kids sound like kids while still being observant enough to engage an adult reader. It's very hard to hold that balance, I believe. Rienwald mimics the voice of a girl in her teenage years by constructing the narration through her discovering of her sexuality, fascination with cruelty her brother excels at, the animal world she tries to comprehend and the similarities she tries to build between the world of the animals and human behavior. To help her parents get closer to each other after the tragedy, she captures a bucket of toads and she believes the moment the toes start to mate with each other, it will be a leading example for her parents to do the same and therefore get closer again. I hardly ever look at novels through the lenses of probability. If those novels are very clearly written to be larger than life, allegorical stories, and this is one of them. And even though most of the time Rinwald manages to keep the narration within the margins of what we would expect from a 10, 12 years old girl, even if it's an unusually observant and very neurotic 12 years old girl, however, there are moments where I was thinking that her thoughts are way too mature for such a young child. You know, when I read a book for a review, I mark themes, quotations with uh, sticker tabs, and then I use post-its to write my comments. And on page 33, I wrote, she is probably the most neurotic 10-year-old I've ever seen. And then I made similar comments on a few pages, and at 212, I wrote after reading, I know though that we'd have to come from a better family to be able to bury our childhood. We have to lie under a layer of earth ourselves, but the time isn't ripe for that yet. I wrote, beautiful, but that's way too mature for a 12-year-old girl. The second problem when reading a novel with a children narrator is the reliability of the narration. How much of the story had its reflection in the fictional real world and how much was created by the young girl left to herself by her parents suffocating with grief? This is the question I was constantly having in my head, right? Rinwald choosing the narrator wasn't interested in serving as the clear answer though. And this is probably what's so brilliant about this uncomfortable dark novel. What will be the most disturbing for most of the readers, though, is the sexual side of the novel. Yas and her siblings engage in various sexual acts, describing them as a sacrifice needed to patch the family's life back together, and when the narration progresses, it becomes more of a fight to save themselves from the family. And behind those sexual acts are quite clear undertones of sexual abuse caused by other perpetrators. Having a mixture of such a young protagonist and so present and descriptive sexuality, there is no getting away from raising various questions in regards to the responsibility of certain narrative and plot devices decisions. The most famous novel addressing young teenage sexuality, of course, Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov, among various accolades, was also criticized widely, being called the filthiest book and sheer unrestrained pornography. And I believe if we put artistic elements to the side and compare those two books, in terms of filth and unrestrained pornography, Lolita, when compared with the discomfort of evening, gets beaten by a mile. I mentioned at the beginning of my video that I read the last one third of it with widely open eyes and often open mouths, 
I believe the last time I experienced similar feelings of huge unease connected with an absolute engagement was when I read A Little Life by Hania Yanigahara. And that book is one of those few that I return with my thoughts to over and over again. And I believe the same effect, the discomfort of evening, will have on me. And this is where I will finish my analysis. If you are still puzzled and try to figure out what is my final verdict, I can tell you only that that makes two of us. <laughs> That's all about the novel, but if you got this far, let me tell you a bit about the author and the inspiration behind the work. Marika Lucas Rienveld is a Dutch poet and a writer, a wunderkind of Dutch literary scene, who published this book in the Netherlands when they were, I believe, 26 years old. It was almost an instant bestseller. Faber and Faber, an English publisher, won the rights to its publication in a heated auction. Marika Lucas Rienveld is a non-binary person. That's why I used they and their pronouns. The pronouns used by them are exactly they and them. Lucas is a self-chosen name selected when they were in their early 20s to represent their non-binary identity. Rienveld, just like Yas and her family, lost their brother. In contrast to the novel, the death was caused by the car accident, I believe, but just like in the novel, the death became a taboo in the family, and Rienveld in one of the interviews said that the fact of breaking the taboo by writing about it was quite hurtful to their family. And they often underline strongly that the parents in the novel are not based on the real-life parents. Therefore, as it often happens, real life was an inspiration, but this is still fiction. Okay guys, I wrap up here. Let me know what you thought about this novel and how did you process the events in this novel? What did you thought about the reliability of the narrator? And thank you for watching. I'll talk to you soon, the next weekend, about Yoko Ogawa's Memory Police. So we'll have a few days of a break from my reviews that are uploaded every few days recently. <laughs> Links to all the books I reviewed so far are down in the description box below. Talk to you soon guys, thank you, have a great weekend, bye bye.